So just for those of you who are not, who haven't seen the play or are not familiar with it, maybe, maybe Murray or Henry, maybe you can just give us an overview of what the what the content is. The only thing I ask is that initially this is intended as feedback to the players in the play and the director. And we will be opening the floor for Q and A after we've we've had our way with Murray and Henry. <laughs> and just maybe to clarify uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, that the play has three characters. Skip played Dr. Jung. Uh, John wiggle at us so we we can see you. John played Beck, and Sherry played the character of the woman and I was the the director and sort of the manager stage manager so go ahead you guys um there's well, Judith hi Judith hi Judith, Judith. Uh, so go ahead and just give us a, a short synopsis of the play okay well, I'll start Henry you feel you fill in the blanks okay um the play is about a conversation that took place between uh, a real conversation that took place between uh, Carl Gustav Jung and Rabbi Leo Beck at a hotel in Zurich in 1946. Really, there are no records as to what this conversation was about, except we know from a letter from Gershom Scholem to uh, Anneli Yaffe that in the course of the conversation, Jung said to Beck several times, ich bin ausgerutscht, hmm. which in German means I slipped up or I slipped off the path. The motivation uh, for the conversation was Jung really desperately wanted to meet with Beck. Beck didn't particularly want to meet with Jung when he was in Zurich, but Jung showed up at his hotel room um, and they did have a conversation, and the play is the conversation. So Henry and I invented a conversation between them based on very skimpy evidence as to what actually took place there. He's been ausgerutscht a couple of times, but we imagined what they might have talked about and who Beck was, uh, who Jung was, what 1946 was like in Europe, and that's the play. Maybe I, that's excellent, Murray. I would just add that we did imagine it, but we drew on many historical documents. And I would say a large part of what the characters say is based on things actually had written or wrote or spoke. So it's sort of an informed imagination. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. That's great. And I would just add to that that if you, if you're not familiar with with Jung's reputation, one of the things that is perhaps the biggest black spot on his reputation is this idea that he was accused of being a, a Nazi sympathizer. And, and it seems to me that, that that's one of the really critical things about his effect in history. And as far as I know, there's been very, very little publication about this controversy. And my feeling is the two of you did an excellent job of reconstructing what must have happened in that in that meeting. And it gets to real depth, it seems to me, that both of these men are being sincere and dedicated in their path. And yet there is a conflict between what each of them sees as the ultimate value. And so each of them has to come to terms with their own vision of the world and how they interact with that. Um, and to me, it was, it was really a wonderful uh, illumination of that, ending with this really powerful idea of teiko malam, which is uh, the Jewish mystical idea that, that there, the world is sort of thrust into chaos, and out of that comes a new awakening. Is there 
Henry, maybe you can you can better explain. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't quite put it like that, but I would say the tikkun olam, it's a mystical idea that the world has been created in a broken, fractured way. And it's an obligation on all of us, not just Jews, to repair the world and restore it to a sense of wholeness. And, and, and it can be like in Hasidism, very simple mundane things done in a conscious way that can bring that. And indeed the play ends as, as Tim, you know very well in that they meet, like you said, when people meet, each one is affected like a chemical reaction. And then each one goes off to find their path, which indeed they did. And another powerful idea is the idea of the gray zone, this, this moral kind of no man's land where we get into a situations where you get into some kind of a personal conflict and there is no way to figure out what the right answer is. And the idea of the gray zone is sometimes there is no right answer. As my father used to say, if you get a mouthful of hot coffee, everything you do next is wrong. <laughs> I think that beautifully explains that sometimes the choice, the choices are just between a bunch of very evil things. And so you sometimes cannot make a good choice. You just have to do what seems right in the moment. And this is carried out in the play when, when Beck asks Jung, if you had the chance to do it again, would you make the same decision? Mm -hmm. One thing I'd like to know is if Murray and Henry, if you saw something in this production that you found was surprising or different or not what you expected. In, in your production. Yeah. It was very different. Um, I found from, um, from our production, well, not in production terms, but in, uh, the actors were different. Uh, you got a different um, feeling from them. Um, uh, I felt the, um, we had very good actors, you had very good actors, but I felt uh, different about them. Our, our Jung, for example, is um, Paul Britchie, who grew up in Basel, and he speaks with a Basler accent. So he, he conveys uh, Jung's words in a way that Jung would have spoken. And for somebody living in Switzerland, that's very effective. That's very powerful to hear Jung uh, uh, speak in that dialect uh, with that accent. That, that's a very specific accent. Um, so um, when I heard um, your production, uh, that didn't come across to me, but other things did. Uh, and I felt that your, um, your Jung was um, more back on his heels than our young that he was he was really um the way the way i see jung uh it was very hard for him to accept his um his shadow responsibility he was a very proud man and even our young didn't quite pull that off to to my satisfaction and to some other people's they said jung wouldn't wouldn't have have bent like that. He wouldn't have bowed like that. Uh, it was very difficult for him to face what Beck had to say. Uh, so I felt that your Jung was more willing to take on the, um, you know, the message that Beck had to deliver in his own way. Beck does not accuse Jung of anything. He said, it's not my job to accuse you but he put it out there in a very strong way. And your Beck was very strong. Our Beck was very strong. Um, and, uh, and your woman was very effective. Um, woman is a, is a creation of our imagination. And it was criticized by some professionals who said, well, you don't need her. What's she doing there? But we felt that's the tie between them. She, she, makes it possible for them to come together. It's an anima presence. She moves in and out. She's enigmatic. She speaks to both of them. And it, she's, the, uh, she's the Mercurius figure that brings the two together and lets them 
<clears throat> speak in a, in a genuine dialogue. So we felt that she was very necessary. I thought your Sherry was very effective. I liked our Sherry too. They're different. And I think yours is just more American and ours is more European. That was my um, feeling about the two productions. Well, well let um, me just say that Murray has been working with an ensemble for many years. He did the Red Book, he did the U Neumann Letters in Israel, and a couple of other pieces. And it's very different working with the ensemble. So we were not just writing for Rabbi Beck and Jung and woman. We were writing for these specific actors and as it were, playing to their strengths. And it is amazing that all the actors, also the cellist, the musician, and also the filmmaker are all Jungian analysts. As though, you know, I often say, you know, in the Hebrew tradition, it's very famous to say, tell me all of Judaism while I'm standing on one leg. <laughs> so the traditional answer is, love your neighbor as yourself, all the rest is commentary. When people ask me, what is Jungian psychology standing on one leg, I say, and. So it's this and this and this and not either or kind of thinking. <laughs> what was striking to me about this play First of all, I felt, John, you look like Beck. I don't know if you saw pictures of him, but you really look like him. The, the kind of thatcher and this, this Hebrew word, yashal, straight, both in posture and in morality, you know, just straight. And, and, and um, Sherry, you were also, uh, you know, really pulled it together. And the whole play, it was like, it was like gathering strength, moving from, from, from intensity to intensity. And, 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 uh, Obviously, you too kept doing, a, as it were, very different. But what I felt so strongly is I forgot our version. And this version worked tremendously in its own right. So I really felt that worked very well. The ending was particularly, I think, if you ask for a moment, it was the ending as though, you know, we were there and we saw the discussions of the audience and clearly the play made an impact on American society that was so different than it had in Europe, you know, and so forth. And it was like a, a living question as though the play continued and still continues as it were unto this very day. Can you expand on that a little bit, Henry? Why, how was it different? How was it different for- Well, no, I think what was different is that I didn't compare them. Because Murray was sort of comparing them, you know, and it is this tendency to sort of see, you know, when you see different plays. And it was as this, I felt you had worked so hard to create a, a gestalt, a togetherness, an emotional investment, an intensity of the human relationship, sort of as it were touching and then moving back and touching the wound and moving back and so forth. And then again, you know, with Beck's telling about Theresienstadt, this very poignant later part of the play and Jung comes to as it were, heal him from that, you know, guilt of the gray zone. I just should say the gray zone is comes from Primo Levi, you know, this outstanding figure who was an Italian chemist, Jewish, but he was taken to Auschwitz as a um, resistance fighter. And he was at Auschwitz for something like two and a half years, something like that, Murray. Yeah. And he wrote, in some ways, he was one of the first people to write about it, and he's still the best. If you don't know him, I highly recommend all of his writings, including about chemistry, which are just fantastic. He's sort of the, the Oliver Sacks of Auschwitz. Um, and um, he, he saw the problem of prisoner doctors who worked in the hospital in Auschwitz, in the camp. And it was this gray zone because if they cooperated with the, with the Nazi doctors, they could save people. And indeed a new, very brilliant documentary is just coming out now in New York. And I highly recommend it about the prisoner doctors. Uh, on the other hand, it was so easy for them to become then collaborators in a negative sense. And indeed, we know uh, this was done. And as you know, one of my mentors, Robert J. Lifton, has studied Auschwitz and the Nazi doctors, he says the whole of Auschwitz was medicalized killing. Who put the Zyklon B gas into the gas chambers? The doctors. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. And I must say to you, Tim, even though, you, you know, 
you know, I felt this was a, a well tempered hand that guided these actors to the best. You know, like a great, a great director, as we say in Hebrew, they didn't know what they were capable of. Oh. But you raise them up as though they became like floating on the stage. You brought them up. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you. Congratulations, Tim. I agree. It was very well directed, beautifully, and performed. Well, it was particularly difficult because we had almost all of our rehearsals by Zoom, because <laughs> this was during the pandemic, you know, and we're on, I'm in the middle of the country in Montana and, and Skip's on the East Coast and the other two are on the West Coast. But this, um, this makes me think about, you know, as a creator, when I put something together, I, I usually have a bunch of different ways of of orchestrating this statement. And I'm very curious, just from a creative standpoint, how, how it is that you arrived at this arrangement. I thought the, the addition of the woman character was really brilliant, but did you think about other arrangements or other ways of presenting this material? We went through about a hundred versions, I think, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so we worked, uh, uh, a couple of times in person, <clears throat> but mostly online going back and forth. And that's what we're doing with this play that we're writing now. Uh, and it's a bit chaotic. And, um, you know, I change things and Henry changes things and we put them back in and we take them out. And um, gradually, um, I get the feeling that something emerges that wants to wants to be said, you know, that, that the themes and the characters step forward finally through this process. It really is very much a process that yeah. Henry and I um, engage in. Uh, we're very critical of each other sometimes. Sometimes, uh, you know, we, we're supportive. But um, in the end, I think um, the play has to emerge from, from this interaction. So neither of us can take all that much credit for it. I think it really is a kind of alchemical process, wouldn't you say, Henry? Yeah. Yes, uh, I would say we did. I agree with Murray, but to answer your question more narrowly, Tim, we had the ensemble. So we had a woman in the ensemble and two men, and that determined what it was, was we both had to be really happy with what we had. And also we agreed uh, that, you know, like, in, like as, as Neumann might say, what was important was the work, not ego. And we would be helpful on the work. And clearly people get, you know, we got a little bruised, but it was for the work. And in a more synchronistic way, maybe I'll tell because it's, it's in the book, but perhaps not all of you have read our dialogue after it in the book. So first of all, this play began as a fairy tale. Ooh. I'm not joking. After many years, I finally convinced Murray to come to Israel. And it's like a prelude to the play. And he said, I don't want to give a lecture. Why don't we just have like a, a conversation in front of an audience? And the idea of Jung's, uh, you know, flirtation with Nazis, writing terrible things came up. Murray was very open about, you know, feeling this. And then, um, of course, Murray, like most people who come to Israel, it's not the Israel of the news. We had a fantastic time. And the next day I said, well, let's go to the Dead Sea and visit Masada. And I won't go into Masada, but it's, it has many reverberations in Israeli culture. And on the top of Masada, we realized that we had both been at Yale around the same time. We'd overlapped for a year or two. And we'd started reminiscing about our time at Yale, which was for both of us, fantastic. You know, Murray had one of the great professors of literature of all times you know, bloom. And I clearly had in, in my fields. And so I said, you know, when I was at Yale, I did a lot of drama. In fact, I was thinking it was in production from freshman to senior year without a break. And then on top of Masada, he turns to me and says, you are the man. I want to write a play about Jung and Beck, and I need somebody who knows more of the Jewish tradition. So it was like, Excellent. how would yeah. Beck speak? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was like, I didn't decide to join him. I was, we were there and so forth. 
You were drafted. Great. <laughs> drafted. <laughs> kind of secret. And then at the end of the process, I mean, Murray and I had been very friendly, good colleagues. You know, Murray, I think what changed our relationship was when you asked me to write the encyclopedia entry on Neumann. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, why is he asking me? You know, but in any case, at the end of our dialogue in the book, Murray says, he grew up, but he didn't have a brother. But working with me on the play made him understand what it would mean to have a brother. And I agree, Murray is like a brother. And I think, you know, he said, he's like a brother to me. And so that's, that energy, I think, underlies the whole project. Wow. And Murray's uh, written a book about brothers and sisters. It's one of his great themes. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, one of, well, speaking of just the following up on the arrangement of how you put this together, one of the really brilliant <clears throat> ideas you had was adding these little interstices, interstices of music. And it was not only powerful emotionally, but it gives us a chance to breathe in between these very heavy encounters. And <laughs> I, I have this sense very much during our rehearsals when we didn't work with music, we just go from one scene to another, that if you hadn't included the music, it would have been too heavy. I think uh, a lot of people would have had more trouble with it, but, but just adding that really simple thing was a brilliant uh, addition on your part. And we had Barbara Miller, you know, she's a professional musician, cellist player. She played for one of the symphonies in Holland um, before she became a Jungian analyst. And um, I knew that about her. And I had, I think I'd incorporated some of her playing into one of our other pieces. Yes, in the, okay. in the Red Book. Um, we did uh, seven scenes from the Red Book with the same ensemble, and she provided the music for that. Yeah. So um, I, uh, we brought her in. She's a part of the ensemble. As Henry yeah. said, this ensemble is very important for our creation. And they made a lot of contributions too. When we put the text out there mm -hmm. uh, and we went through it, they would make some changes and they'd say, they would say, well, I can't say it that way. How about this way? And then uh, Barbara would change her music a bit and create the mood. So it mm -hmm. really was an organic process as the play evolved with, with the ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, and that music is, uh, mm -hmm. is very important and will be a part of our our next yeah. play as well. I think it gives people a time to digest a scene. These scenes are heavy and you need a little moment to uh, take it in and reflect on it and before you move on to the next. Yes, I, I, I do want to say one or two words also about Barbara. I mean, she was, the, I think the idea of the music reading was yours, Marie. I, I also want to say since I'm also, in addition to being a psychologist, you an analyst, I'm also an anthropologist, Robert Miller is not only a an analyst and professional, she's also a very highly talented anthropologist, an expert on the Sami people, and has done field work and things like that about there. Shh. The actors were very much partners in the script, and we, they would say, I can't say that, what we wrote. We have to change it. And it was very much a dialogue with the actors, which is, I think, more typical of an ensemble in this way. And Barbara also, I mean, as you know, many of the music that she plays was written at Auschwitz, at Theresienstadt, sorry, at Theresienstadt, where Rabbi Beck was. And this, I think, provides like even a deeper level of uh, music. And, and Barbara, just she's like one of these wonderful, uncomplicated people. I mean, uncomplicated in the sense he's not problematic, as many musicians are. And she brought, I think, Marie, won't you agree, like a special energy, Very not nice. just a special, like a special musical atmosphere in addition to the music itself. Yeah, and she really worked on researching the music from uh, Theresienstadt and brought that in in such a delicate way and beautifully uh, incorporated into the mood of the play. It was a great contribution on her part. Oh man, that's great. And she surely well, shared with us quite openly her work on the music and uh, that allowed um, Carson Yaba, who was our cellist, to pretty much do a very similar thing to what she had done uh, in the actual play or in the video of the play. 
Well, I've, I've got a, a few more kind of esoteric questions, but I wonder if we could turn to questions from the rest of the audience here. Well, I, I, Tim, before we do that, let's give the players a chance to oh, to okay, speak. I think that's fair yeah, enough. Sure. <laughs> sure, John. Do you have any comments about it? Well, I'll I'll speak up because for us it was the same thing in terms of uh, bringing our ourselves to the script and what we could say, what we couldn't say. I know Skip had some passages. He says, "I just can't say those lines." And for myself, I really researched Beck, uh, read his biography. Um, I, I had the same question in my mind, how would Beck speak? And I, there's nothing out there, there's no recordings, there's no videos, there's no audio recordings, nothing. I couldn't see him move. Um, so I had to just figure out the best I could who he was uh, and then studied all around that issue as well. And we did rewrite the script in several ways. Uh, for instance, the, the statement, uh, you know, this is like something out of Mein Kampf. Well, no, it was something out of Mein Kampf. Uh, just little things like that that really change an emphasis of a statement. Uh, and sometimes bigger things as well. I consulted locally with a rabbi here about you know, how to do, how to say Kaddish. Uh, he's the one who gave me the yarmulke, which I still have. So, yeah, I felt like I got to know this man to a certain extent, as best he could be known, and then brought that into the play. I have a couple of questions for you, John. Did, mm -hmm. you, did you watch um, John Hill's performance? Did you? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we started with that place. I think the main the main thing I felt is I wanted to bring more more obvious emotion into it. Uh, -huh. uh otherwise uh, i felt you know he understood he understood back pretty well yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what are the lingering effects for you playing playing a role like bex does he uh, uh, you get into the role you identify with it what happens to you uh you know people have asked me that question and i i think that i uh, in many ways actually i i speak more directly uh, issues. I'm more likely to speak up about issues uh, to the point, uh, matter of factly, state my position, you know, say what I believe about things. I find myself doing that more, more often and uh, with more emphasis. And it was the play that made that change in me. Yeah, drama yeah. therapy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, I just want to say Beck had a strong American connection. Mm -hmm. He taught for a number of years in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. which at that time was the center of the liberal reform movement. Also, Beck, who was a reform Jew, a liberal Jew, mm -hmm. in a way that is inconceivable today, he was the leader of all of German Jewry, from the most mm -hmm. fanatical ultra-Orthodox to mm -hmm. the secular. You know, and one of the horrible things, many, many of the horrible things that Hannah Arendt said, you know, she called him the Jewish Führer, and yeah. Gershon Scholl forced her mm -hmm. to apologize, which he didn't do very often. I mean, just a, a parental thing, we have new tapes that have come of interview with Eichmann before he was captured. And you really see this man is a fanatic Jew yeah. hater who says, I feel a failure because there were more Jews to kill, and I didn't mm -hmm. get to kill them. Very not a variant. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing is that Beck came from a uh, German-Jewish, what is called the Yeke background, mm -hmm. maybe Sherry knows that term, uh, which is like, I would say, they make emotional restraint into an art form. Mm -hmm. But we got a fantastic compliment when the show was premiered at the Cinematheque in Jerusalem, from a, a friend of mine who was an expert on that period of Jew, he's a mm. historic professor of history. And he came to me and he said to me, you got him completely right, mm. except mm. for the direct question of saying, why did you not speak out? Uh -huh. And he said he wouldn't do it directly like that because it was too mm -hmm. emotional for him. <laughs> but I thought you carried him beautifully, John, really. 
Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Very, very, yeah. Very I, did, I did a very, really, really wide research, in, including I watched the entire Eichmann trial all over again. So I understand what you're saying, Henry, about yeah. Eichmann. And one thing that just was driving me crazy as I was reading all of this, and I tried to bring some of it in into my play, is I realized in Berlin, occupied Berlin, I mean, Nazi Berlin, and even in the camps, these various Jewish sects were bickering with each other right to the gas chambers. They could not get along. And, and you know, Beck was, you're, he was trying, I mean, he, he saw this more universal uh, thing. It's, it's, it's about having a Jewish identity um, yeah. yes. and, and tried to hold that very strongly. And that's what I tried to bring into the play as well. Yes. Well, sort of in X memory, I want to say the only thing that's surprising, John, that the Jews were fighting, in, you know, to the edge of the gas chamber, is that you're surprised. Well, <laughs> well it's, okay. not, it's not just us after all. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we have a joke, which is like very apropos of this. Uh, uh, a Jewish person was uh, shipwrecked and lived on a island for 10 years and finally he was rescued and CNN is doing a special on him and he's recreated his entire town on the island and he's being interviewed by the CNN anchor and he say so to speak and he says well it's very interesting Mr. Cohen you know you recreated your whole town and you made two synagogues he says well, of course one synagogue I pray in and the other synagogue I would never set foot in there <laughs> 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 <That's great. laughs> well, well, Skip, let's hear from you. Well, I, I'd let, rather hear from Sherry first, and then okay. then I'll speak. Okay. Sherry, go for it. All right. Um, well, it was an honor to be in your play, and it was also an honor to work with Tim. This is the first time I've acted, and as Skip says, I was drafted. Um, I tried to get out of it <laughs> several times, but they wouldn't let me. So I had to just hunker down and it became a community building project. Uh, John and I are, are um, partners and, um, and well, fiancés right now. <laughs> and, <Muzzle. laughs> and, and, and so it was wonderful having that time with him to do a project together and and words from the play would keep seeping into our um, conversations. We'd start having jokes around it, and and um, and we, you know, every once in a while, I, I can't think of it right now, but um, it would be direct words from the play, and then we'd we'd say, oh, we have to do the funny version sometime of of the play of of how we reacted to it. But yeah, the teamwork. Not only did we work with skit with. Uh, Tim, and we didn't even tell Tim we did this, but we worked with Tim every Sunday. But Skip, John, and I did another Zoom like around three months or two months before the play, realizing we need more, more practice. And we sometimes got together twice a week on top of what we did with Tim. And it was a really free for all kind of thing where we were able to criticize each other and, and say things that um, maybe Tim wouldn't have said to each other. And, and, um, so it, it was really, really remarkable. And in a certain way, I mean, I, I was able to take on my role because it was the smallest role. And I, I really didn't realize the importance of my role until after the play and people came up to me and said, you know, how I pulled things together and, and how I was so important where to me it was minor next to what the other two men did. And, and I realized it, it, it wasn't. I, I set the scene for them to get together and, and right. to meet. Yeah. And um, uh, Tim's guidance was, was wonderful. And so much changed before, between, we had two pre-trial uh, tries on stage. So as we said, we did in Zoom, we met in person twice ahead of that. And, um, and, and between the dress rehearsal and the final, so much changed in me. And, and I was able to bring across much more emotion, be closer to Skip or, or John. And, and so it was amazing to have that dress rehearsal on stage. It, it, it was, you know, just wonder, a wonderful experience. 
And, and also, I didn't know how to enter the role. I had seen your version of it. And again, I also want to bring in some more emotion, make it more American. <laughs> but, but my way in was to play with a Yiddish accent. And when I first started, it was much stronger. And and everything was in Yiddish and, and Skip would say, well, you're too um, lyrical or something or whatever. And Tim would say, well, you don't always have to be that way. And so it started getting less and less, but it, 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 it's what formed the role for me. Mm -hmm. And by the end, I think I was hardly doing it, uh, mostly because at the dress rehearsal, someone said that it's more important for me to enunciate than to come across with this Yiddish accent. So I, um, took that to heart too. Um, but it was, and, and the depth of the play became so much more apparent the more we did it. And that was amazing, the unfolding of the play. Because I remember all of a sudden it was like this, this light bulb went off. It was like, uh, Hyung didn't know why he was there talking to Beck. All right, he had some dreams and dreams said he was there. Then he uh, had that connection and, with the Jewish people and delving into that. And then getting to the point of uh, admitting he he strayed off the path. And it was when I realized that and I counted the times, it was like, yes. And then when I said, this is why you are here, that line had so much more emphasis and meaning to me. It was like, finally, it was coming together. Um, so anyway, it was. I, I thought it was a, a beautiful play. I was honored to be in it, and um, it uh, formed me in in some different ways too. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Sherry. Yeah. Skip, your turn. <laughs> okay. Well, I of course I came to this from long study of Jungian psychology. I'm not a psychologist, and I never took a psychology course, but I've been studying Jung since 1987, about the same time as Tim started. And when we were first reading it together, I became very emotional because I, I hadn't really grokked the fact that the role was that I had to eat Jung's shadow. I had to, yeah. I had to accept it and acknowledge it. And that was quite difficult, I found, uh, especially since I was so invested in Jung's work and and his his li literally his literary production uh, that that I found it very difficult to eat his shadow. But ultimately, I was able to do it. Uh, the first time we read it, I I uh, just wept through the entire reading practically. There, there were a few things that I refused to say. After Sherry asked, can there re be reconciliation without forgiveness in, I guess it's in scene seven, there were some things that you had in there that I refused to say because I said I refused to teach anyone what the excuses for anti-Semitism are. I, and that's why I did not speak those lines and refuse to speak those lines. And I, over the years, have become quite connected with not only Jung's oeuvre, but also with this play, because among other things, the actual meeting, the date of the meeting is actually the day after I was born in 1946. And the very first notable person whose death I remember seeing on the news was Carl Jung's death mm -hmm. in 1961 when I was 15. Mm -hmm. And of course, the name Conover uh, is the same name as Mary Mellon, and uh, all Conovers are cousins. And so the fact that she was the wife of Paul Mellon, who founded the Bollingen Foundation with her, and she had died. I suspect that Jung's name was floating around in my household for a long time, and that's why I remember that. 
And uh, when I was in law school, I would, one of my professors was Thomas Bergenthal, who was the youngest human being to survive Auschwitz. And there's uh, several books about his experience, but ultimately he survived. He went, came to the US, he became an attorney. When he was in his 40s was when I, he was my professor of international law. And I actually took more courses from him than anyone. Um, but I, I remember very clearly him wearing short sleeve shirts to make sure that we could see his tattoos. And um, we were, at that time, we were reading um, his textbook. It's a two volume textbook called uh, The International Protection of Human Rights. We were reading it in mimeo form in my classes. And later he, he became uh, a judge of the Central, Ameri Central American Court of Justice. And then Bill Clinton put him on the International Court of Justice as the American Justice in 1994, I believe. And he served at, at The Hague for 10 years um, as the American Justice on the International Court of Justice. And so I've thought about these issues for a long time. Of course, Eichmann's story was became very prominent when I was in high school. I remember reading the book about Eichmann when I was in my shop class. I would read the book instead of doing my shop project. So anyway, I found, for, I, I found that the play itself is a synopsis of Jungian psychology, I feel. And I think it's terrific in that respect. And I think it's terrific in general. And I had great confidence in it from the beginning. And I knew that uh, John and Sherry would come, come to it too if they just spent some time with it, which they did. You know, John will always be my rabbi. <laughs> well, I I want to have some time for other questions. Yeah, surely. Uh, Let me just anybody... add a historical note, Jim. Let me just add another historical note. Yeah. In the play, Beck talks about this woman who asked whether she should join her husband who was sent to the East. This is a real case of somebody who was at Auschwitz for two years. She was always ashamed because she didn't have a number. She okay. somehow survived. She came, she lost all of her family. At some point she was going out with a person who was interested in dreams and she says, dreams, I have to find out about dreams. She connected with Neumann. She became his star student disciple. And she is still a force of nature at 96 in Israel. Her son is now training with us. And indeed, uh, on, you know, on the one hand, this reflected the gray zone. On the other hand, and Beck also had married her and her husband. So it was another level that we didn't put into the play. On the other hand, the fact that Beck said, perhaps you shouldn't go undoubtedly saved her life. Mm. Wow. Mm. What is her name? Dvora Kuczynski. And if you're interested in hearing more, send me an email and I'll send you okay. uh, an interview I did with her. Wow, that's great. Any other questions? So did she, she did go to Auschwitz or not? She afterwards, afterwards. Afterwards, okay. After her husband was killed. She uh, so was when, when she asked. And uh -huh. survived there. And she is very open about entering the showers and not knowing what's going to happen. Oh. Mm. Wow. Murray knows her. She's, she's well known among Indians. I, she was at one of the IEP congresses. I think the one in Vienna made a talk, yeah. didn't she? Yeah, she's she's a really a remarkable woman. 
Mm. Wow. You know, Grunberg to me was another interesting character. And in my research, I, I began to understand that there were these people who went into and out of the camps and brought this information out. Yeah. Um, and I really began to understand who that man was as I was interacting with him. That was really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I have a question. Go ahead, Leah. Go ahead. Um, I think it was Henry a while back uh, mentioned that the the European audience responded differently than the American mm. audience. And I wondered if you could say more about that. So actually, it was Murray who said that. So oh, okay. I think Murray should answer. Mm. Okay. Since he lives, he's an American, but they're in Canadian, but he lives in Europe. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you said it, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I think, uh, I think the, the point was that uh, uh, when we saw the discussion after your play, it was so lively. And um, uh, really, people engaged uh, with the issues and, and wanting to discuss them more. I think in Europe, it wasn't quite, uh, quite to that level. There was some interest. We would have discussions after the performance, but they would be more shallow or um, shorter. So mm -hmm. I think that was the difference that we saw, wasn't it, Henry, that, that the discussion after your play was extraordinarily interesting and showed how, how engaged the people had become. Uh, uh, not only with the characters, but the issues that uh, that are raised in the play. Mm. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll just sorry. Maybe I'll just add. I think in Europe there was the, the discussions was more around the gray zone, mm. And, mm. and for you it was like it's contemporary. It's it's about us in America today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, having lived yeah, in sure Europe like for a couple of years in about a dozen years ago. Uh, one thing that really struck me was that there's the uh, the um, the trauma of it has has made the society shut down mm. for decades, and now it's just getting to the point where it feels like the grandchildren of the people who were uh, engaged in this in this terrible struggle are finally able to to talk about the story behind. Uh, the whole, the whole Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. I was astonished to think that that this has been lying underground for all this time, whereas in America it seems like you know we're we're a lot better at just picking scabs and <laughs> letting it all out. <laughs> I think it's in the third generation in Germany. I hear this uh, story a lot. And I've worked with people who are the children of uh, <clears throat> parents who were, um, you know, in Germany during the Nazi period. And of course, after the Nazis were defeated, uh, nobody was a Nazi anymore. Uh, there had been no Nazis. Everybody was, you know, everybody had been opposed to the Nazis. So it was hard to find a Nazi anymore. Uh, of course, that was all a lie and a cover up because they were all Nazis. And um, so that was that was hidden from the children. And the latest story I heard is that the parents' anger at being uh, at the at the allies for being defeated, they couldn't show the anger because they also felt guilty at the same time for what they'd done. But the anger was taken out on the children. Mm. So the children of that generation were very, very harshly raised. Mm. And um, I, I worked with a woman for quite some time whose mother, you know, I, I actually I know a couple of people whose parents were of that generation and um, they were terrible parents. They, they were extremely critical. Um, they wanted to raise their children in a kind of Nazi <laughs> formula and fashion to be strong and tough and don't cry and don't ever express any emotion. And um, and then in the next generation, in the third now, it's uh, a little freer and people are beginning to ask the questions, well, what did our grandparents <clears throat> do? Where were they again? Can you tell us about it? And now it's slowly um, coming to the surface and being processed, but it's taken a long time. Henry, you know a lot about traumas in Israel. I mean, it takes generations, doesn't it, to, to really get over these massive collective traumas. Yes, yes. Let me give you a poignant example. Many years ago at a Congress, which is 
was in Jerusalem. We had an informal meeting. I was a candidate there it's about 40 years ago um, between the German candidates and the Israeli candidates. And it was a kind of an affinity that we both had been through something. And mm -hmm. we had an amazingly open discussion. Jerome was part of it, you know. And um, the Germans say, we all are in analysis with people who lived during the war. And we, we, we need to know what happened to them, but we dare not ask, and we have no way of knowing. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. You just couldn't yeah. ask. Uh, it was stum, quiet. Let's, uh, let's hear from Colleen. Colleen. Uh, you're muted, Colleen. Thank you, Skip. Um, to that issue of the third generation, uh, I had a student uh, in art therapy who um, is a third generation, and uh, she's doing her PhD dissertation on that subject oh. uh, and how they find each other, uh, that if they're in a group, they tend to uh, pick up on the accent that's still there. And, um, and the first question is, what did you know? What did they know? Yeah. And just exactly what you're speaking to, how difficult it is on, on their relationships in the family when they begin to ask these questions. But they do seem to find each other. Hmm. These are very painful questions, extremely painful in families, you know, that uh, to open that up is, um, you know, raises so much, uh, uh, I don't know, guilt and anguish and uh, very difficult topic. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that applies to all of us because here in, in America, all of us live on stolen land mm -hmm. and we haven't come to terms with that. We haven't come to terms with slavery in this country. There's, you know, one of the things that's so powerful about this play is, is we all have to come to terms with how we got here and what our own family story is and what our uh, role is in perpetuating atrocities that we've inherited. Well, that's, I think, uh, that's what the play at its deepest level is about, facing the shadow. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, we tried to bring Jung around to doing. We don't know that he really did it, but I think he did, at least to some extent, with that phrase, ich bin ausgerutscht, which he said to Beck several times, according to Beck's report, that uh, Beck's manner somehow, and, uh, and not, not really accusing him or, or you know, trying to make him feel guilty, but just being there and reporting what he had experienced and Jung taking that in and remembering what he had said and done during those early years, uh, the 30s, uh, I think had an effect on him. Well, I, uh, Henry or Murray, I think that you at one point said to me that Ishbin Ausgarush means he fell off the path and that for someone who lives in Switzerland, that yeah. means falling to your death. Yeah, uh, you which off the path in the mountains, you go yeah. along down and often yeah. die. Yeah. yeah. Again, I, Skip, we, I should say that the letter that Gershon Shulam wrote to Aniele Yaffe, it's translated as I slipped up, which seemed very f flip. Right. Very but you know, Murray, you know, a very capable German and also consulted, felt, and I agreed that it, that was not an accurate translation. Yeah. Yes. And I slipped I, up in English is very mild, you know, oh, I slipped up. No, it yeah. wasn't like that. You wouldn't say something like that to Beck under these circumstances. Yeah. And, and, and remember, it's that Beck, you know, clearly uh, was affected by that and came to Eronos the following year yeah. and, and, and maintained, because they had been friends. I think it's important to say they had been friends at the School of Wisdom in Darmstadt in the 20s and mm -hmm. had a correspondence, which we use in the play. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, and they were drawn to each other in, in, I think also in a personal way, not just in a theoretical uh, concern. And also Beck uh, 
that convinced Sholem to attend Eranos on the basis of that statement. Um, so that Sholem had some misgivings about Eranos because Eranos had been so involved with Jung. Was Eranos, you know, pro-Nazi and so on? And uh, and Sholem immediately uh, accepted uh, what Beck had told him, and he started and, and lectured at Eranos for many years after that, starting in 1946. Yeah. So um, it was. Uh, it was a very effective. Well, I have the impression that uh, the Jungian analyst community has shied away from this uh, shadow side of Jung, at least publicly. Maybe they are dealing with it in their clinical sessions, but publicly, I, except for this, uh, I see very rare acknowledgments of uh, Jung's shadow. Yeah, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far. There are two volumes, very good, by our good friend Arya Maidenbaum, which I yeah. recommend to you. Lingering also, shadows. Etsy, hmm? lingering shadows. It's called. Yes, lingering shadows, and they did the second a conference in New York in the nineteen nineties. Right. At, uh, yeah. Yeah. Also, a number of analysts have written very much about this. Betsy Cohen and a number of others have written about this, and I think. In, in Israel, we dealt with this from the beginning of our training. We have courses on anti-Semitism, on Jung's anti-Semitism and so forth. I think, Murray, in your training, that really didn't come up, this issue. Never mentioned, never mentioned in my training, no. So, yeah. so it's, it skip your right, but there are, there has been some attempts uh, to deal with this. Yeah. And um, I think I have also written about this too. Well, and Andrew so Samuel has raised it many times. And, uh, yes, Andrew Samuel, sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a it's a, it's a it's a very difficult topic, and it doesn't go away. And Jung knew it wouldn't go away. Right. Uh, yeah. It's um, yeah. yeah. That's well, why it's called ling lingering shadows. Yeah. Also, the you know, um, lingers, even though I think Jung did face it and did come to terms with it. Um, um, uh, which is what we put in the play, um, and and um, uh, was aware of um, his responsibility, but something like that doesn't doesn't disappear. It will always it will always be a factor. It'll always be there. Right. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about that. Like in the play, when he first said that he went astray. Uh, uh, before that, he mentions that uh, he was deaf and insensitive, and he sees that he was tragically misguided by the habits of the collective consciousness. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the most important things that I got from the play is that uh, I wonder if you could elaborate on the collective consciousness at his time, but also even now in our time. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Jung wrote an essay late in life on conscience, the psychology of conscience. And he says that um, the worst problems of conscience are conflict of duties. When you don't know, this is the gray zone idea too, you don't know if this is right or that, you have to either two goods or two bads and, and you have to balance them and you don't know. And the reason you don't know is that your mind is taken over by collective uh, opinions and, and ideas. So those Nazi soldiers who are executing mothers and children in Eastern Europe and sending pictures home, which you can see at uh, Yad Vashem uh, in Israel, sending pictures home, proud of what they're doing, working for the Fuhrer, thought they were doing the right thing. They thought they were doing the good thing. They were following their conscience, the collective conscience, conscience of the time. And this is such a trap. We, uh, you see it in the United States now, you see it in Europe now. People get caught in these, um, in these collective silos and start uh, interacting with each other, only not able to listen to the others. And pretty soon their minds are filled with certain opinions and certain ideas, and they think those are the correct ideas. Later, 
10 years later, looking back at that, they will say, what in the hell got into me? How could I not see what other people were seeing at that time? How could I not make a, a correct judgment? Because your mind is invaded by the collective. And it's very hard when the collective gets going, especially around issues of war, threat, danger, peril, uh, you stop thinking. You stop, you, you can't rise above the level of the collective angst and you're trapped in it. Uh, and um, uh, so Jung was a part of his community, a part of his culture, Swiss, German. Um, uh, they were all anti-Semitic. It, it still is an anti-Semitic culture. Uh, a lot of people have stepped out of it by now and can see that, but Europe is still anti-Semitic and it's gotten worse in the last couple of years. Um, and uh, if you're in these groups um, and subscribe to their fundamental view of the world, often backed by religious ideas, you get trapped in that. That's the collective consciousness. Yeah, and, that, uh, that, yeah uh, if, you're an, if you're an outlier, uh, you have to be an outlier to get away from that. That's, yeah. a, that's a problem and then you're punished for that. So you get back into this whole circular thing, you know. That seems uh, equivalent to participation mystique. Yes, yes, very much. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Which is unconscious. You're, you're mm -hmm. in participation, unconscious participation with your culture. Now, you know, Jung grew up in a Christian family. His father was a minister. His grandfather was a minister. His grandfather actually was a great Zionist. But... Zionism is a kind of anti-Semitic uh, operation too. If you think at that time, well, all the Jews should go somewhere else, okay? Be a Zionist, they should all leave Europe and go to Israel or go to Africa or Madagascar or wherever. It was a type of anti-Semitism, uh, but it, uh, under the guise of um, Zionism. So Jung's grandfather was part of organizing big Zionist meeting in uh, 98, wasn't it? I saw a newspaper article about that just uh, yesterday in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung of an anniversary of that uh, first Zionist meeting in Basel. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's it, a very tricky thing. Uh, oh. If you're a Jew and a Zionist, it's one thing. If you're a Christian Gentile and a Zionist, it might be a very different thing. And Jung oh. grew up uh, one of his earliest statements in uh, the Zafingia lectures, when he talks about the Jews uh, infesting uh, Western Christian culture with their ideas, with their taking over, you know, they're too successful, they're taking over the ideologies of the West, look at Marx and so on and so forth. Um, uh, he was, a, he, he was, he grew up in that. Um, it was very difficult for him to step out of it. And that's why when he meets Beck and if he begins to get a glimmer, he can step out, I think, for the first time and really see something that he wasn't able to see before. That aspect of the shadow that is so insidious and difficult to root out or to see because we're caught in it. Very hard to know uh, what's right and what isn't. Wouldn't you say, Henry, you're an expert? Well, I, I agree with everything you said. I would just say, like in America today, and I think what, what you said, Jerome, it's that belonging, uh, being led, are deep needs. And if we're lucky, our leader is like, okay, but it, it's like, this is what happened to the Germans. And I think you know, I don't want to talk about the United States because I don't live there, but I think people are like giving over themselves to somebody who will guide them. Fathers knows best psychology. Mm -hmm. And also in a primary sense, you know, there are only two groups. Us and them. And it provides a deep sense of belonging, satisfying, you know, conspiracy theory. It simplifies the world in a very satisfying way. You know, Eric from around the same time wrote a beautiful book called Escape from Freedom, which is as true then as now. And it's like 
the idea of really facing individual choice, you know, the kind of new ethic that Neumann talked about and believed in, it's too painful for most people. You know, and if you see in a, in a good way, for most Americans, the most satisfying thing they have in their life is football games, baseball games. And I mean in a serious way, because you're, you're together, you're in a collective and so forth. It, clearly it can spill over, but it's the right place because it's a game. When it spills over, then it's, it, the consequences happen. When it's a game, you like start another game, you know, after, after the thing. So sadly, I think we, we, including me and Murray, we have to face that what's happening now and what happened to Hitler is not an uh, exception, yeah. more like the rule. Right. Uh, Philippe had a question. Is that all connected with uh, 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 how difficult it is to uh, uh, build and use the help of others to have personally a strong enough ego because when i when my ego is weak and i know a lot about that personally uh, i need to belong uh, to a group i can't survive I, my feet are not my my legs don't hold me yeah. i need to be part of a group it doesn't matter right left and 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 the more fanatic the better it's clear cut yeah i know who we are and who the enemy is, you know. That's right. Us and them. That's it. And 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 Jung, when uh, Rabbi Beck confronted him, uh, it's a testimony to his that he had uh, enough ego to be seen to see his own shadow, which by definition we don't we don't see it, yeah. and not uh, like in Switzerland uh, to slip or to fall is to die because it's all mountains. And he could afford to see it because he had strong ego. He didn't, uh, and he needed Beck. Yeah. We need somebody to show us our shadow. We know? all need that. We all need that, um, that mirror that we can see behind ourselves, <laughs> see ourselves in another light. Yeah. So uh, I saw Jewel's hand before I saw Jordan. So Jewel, go ahead. Thank you. Huh? some reason I don't have it on my screen today to be able to raise that digital hand. When I watched this play uh, again today, I'd watched it a couple of times earlier and it was so good to be impressed in the presence of these people who not only have read it, but have lived it as the actors. And I'm going to say several things and not pausing for an answer. So it's going to be some open-ended questions. One is I'm so thankful I want to say to the authors, and I don't know how you came about writing that. For me as an individual building on the comments today, when I finished it this morning, I said, but at the end of it, that's where I get with, at the end of it, they recognized and spoke of what their differences were. And to me, that's an awareness rather than hiding something, you know, under a bushel or whatever, yeah. or denying it. But with this being said, part of the talk today that I heard was third generation. And within me, I'm recognizing uh, that at my age, I'm 70, that of course I wasn't in that war but I had family that was, and I recognized that I am the third generation of family that had secrets and family that could not talk. And as it was said earlier, we didn't know how, it wasn't modeled for us. You know, it was shameful, it was secrets. What I'm collecting, know today that I am in a collective group who understands my individual longings and needs. Within that, I have an individual need to be, continue being in a group this way so that I can glean from you the modeling that was not taking place for me within an individual family. I think today that is what <coughs> the United States longs for and I speak because I can't get it, I don't understand it. 
I never had the biases and the prejudices. That is my blessing. <laughs> the curse is there are not enough people to say, let's sit down and talk about it. And that is what I think this group is providing for me. And then the question that was asked, we dare not ask. We dare not ask because we've not been in an environment where we can sit and talk openly like today. Perhaps what do we do as individuals and create our own uh, destiny and our futures for those that we do have a personal influence so that we can plant those seeds to build that collective so that we can go forth because you use terms today that without this group that skips provided opportunities and each member in here I wouldn't have known what you were talking about I have my own shadow but until I knew that, it was only that little thing that followed me around as a child. Now it is that thing living inside of me that I want out and to bring to light and model to those that I will choose to talk about it. So it is the art and creative unconscious and Carl Jung and those that talk that have brought me to a new position in life and a new place and I am at a new juncture. Each of you have been a part of that. Some of the books I've read from authors that are sitting here, the creative abilities that have been given to me. I was not there in Montana because my body told me ahead of time it could not go despite the spirit did. I ended up sick with COVID during that time. Since then, when I was recovering, I planned on where I was going next. So y'all planted seeds in my heart and I'm reading it and growing with it today. Now I'm going to turn it back over you and ask you to continue being my teachers, my inspiration, to model for me, to be part of that collective group so that I can grow as an individual and that I can have a tribe where we do dare ask. So thank you. Very important. Very important to focus on that issue of collectives that foster individuation and don't stifle it. Yeah. Uh, yes, Jordan, uh, go ahead. Yeah, it's quite a statement. Well, thank you, Henry and Murray for the inspiration for this play to happen over here. And I see such a dignity in difference that you conveyed in the process of the play, do you see an idea line, lineage between Jung's and, as you said, Henry, or the both and rather than either or, and um, Beck's drive to cultural identity with Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs' dignity and difference concept? Mm. Well, I think Jonathan Sachs, even though he's an Orthodox rabbi, would very much see himself as a continuation of Beck. Beck was very much aware of the dangers of the cult of the individual, which is so widespread today. And he, in a way, allowed himself to disappear as an individual. But there are all over the Jewish world, and not just uh, institutes of study, schools, special high quality schools that uh, as you would want to cultivate the individual within a collective identity in Jerusalem, in New York, in London, and other places. Uh, um, so I, yes, and I think we did want to get across uh, Beck as a person who dignity is inherent to his self. When, Thank Beck, you. Uh, when Beck lectured uh, at Eranos in um, 47, Remember, Henry, we're writing about this. The topic of his um, of his talk was individuum ineffabile, ineffabile, the ineffable individual, mm -hmm. and he focused on the individual, but um, not to the exclusion of the individual participating in community. Um, that's a split, you know, you're either going to be an individualist or you're going to belong to a community. You, you can't do both. That's not the idea. And Beck was putting out the idea that 
the individual is ineffable, one of a kind. God stamps out each individual uniquely. Remember, Henry? Um, and um, uh, But you also belong to a kinship group. If you're Jewish, you belong to a Jewish people. If you're Christian, you might belong to a Christian church or whatever. You, you have communities, you have family, you have nations. Um, and this isn't an either or choice, it's a both and. But those communities need to be structured in a way that they don't um, smother the individual. And they allow the individual to flourish. Uh, and um, I think the Jewish people are very good at that. Uh, very individualistic on the one hand, but definitely belong to the people. Uh, Beck wrote a book called This People Israel, you know? Yeah. Um, so he was very aware of the community, but also focused on the individual. And I think that's what uh, Jungians have to do too. Jungians have been more focused on individual, individuation as a kind of individual, personal, private project, and rather weak on the collective side. Now, uh, I think people like Skip have created communities, which is great among Jungians. So Jungians getting together, speaking with each other, individuating at home privately, but also sharing in a, in a group um, uh, spirit, I think is the way forward. I think that's what we have to build. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne, uh, you have your hand up. Susan. Uh, is, that, is that me? Yes. yes. Um, I'm not sure I'm not visible, but my question is regarding the third generation. Uh, do you think that it's possible in a third generation to have some kind of a, how, I'm just thinking of how to phrase it, some kind of a imprinting uh, in the field, so to speak, of the original first generation trauma, but now it's not about the, um, the concentration camp, but it's about the victim persecutor kind of a dynamic. Um, Henry, I guess I would ask you that question or maybe Mary. You, is my question clear? I, if you could clar clarify it, it, I think it would be helpful for us. Um, so I am wondering that for the third generation children of parents that have been in the Holocaust, whether they are more prone to experience some kind of a trauma by implication because they have been imprinted down the line, down the mm. ancestral line. Mm. Mm. Well, let me give you, as we would say in, in Hebrew, you know, we're, Jews are very associative. So I'm not gonna talk about the Holocaust. I'll talk about something else that's of great interest to me. And this is the syndrome of the replacement child. This turns mm -hmm. out to be extremely common where say a, a, a mother has a child. I mean, I'll give you the example of our close colleague, Kristina Shilensky, who's written extensively in a beautiful book about this. So she had an older brother when she was in her mother's womb, this brother died. She was born into the loss of her older brother in a way that perhaps seems bizarre to us, but was acceptable in their collective and certainly it's common in Palestinian society, the child was buried in the front yard. So every time you went out or in, you as it were had to pass through this, this dark curtain. And people have this, this kind of trauma that they may even not know that the mother had an, had an abortion or a stillbirth or a child who died or from a previous marriage or something like this. In a, in a way, I think perhaps this is connected to what you want to say is that this trauma is unconsciously absorbed to the extent that people who have this syndrome, like third generation, the, their connection with themselves is ghostly in the sense that they have elements in their unconscious that don't belong to them. They belong to this dead brother. And there's a sense in which I, he died so I may live. So there's a sense of survivor guilt, even though you weren't there, but you somehow pick it up, this kind of thing. 
there's a lot more to say about survivor trials, including that it starts in the Bible. You know, after Abel was killed, Adam and Eve, and it says explicitly they have another child, Seth, in order to replace Abel. Wow. But replacement children are also, oh, and Jung himself had three brothers and sisters die before he was born, and undoubtedly this affected his concern with the this concern with ghosts, with spirits, with things that pervades his work in the Red Book and the Black Book and so forth. But like you, there are many, many, many people who were replacement child who have this, as it were, very unusual syndrome who are extraordinarily creative. And it is because of that, as it were, unspoken trauma that pushes them towards creativity. And I'll only give one example, which will stand for the others. Yeah. Salvador Dali, was born nine months and 17 days after his older brother, also called Salvador Dali, had died. And wow. so it was explicitly this. And people, when they interviewed him, they, you know, Salvador Dali, you're quite um, surrealistic and extravagant and, and, and expressive. And he says, well, of course, I have to prove to the world and to myself that I am the living Salvador Dali and not the dead one. Mm. Wow. You know, another great example of that is Rainer Maria Rilke, who of course was raised I mean, as Sophie the first five or six Rilke, years. Ago. Van Gogh, yeah. uh, Barry, who write Peter Pan, his older brother died skating. He mm. tried to become his older brother. I, it was a late kind of thing, and he was amazing. And part of this whole Peter Pan uh, thing, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the woman who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, she also was. So, Beethoven, Goethe, um, so it, it's a real phenomenon, but obviously some people are like captured by the ghosts, by the dark and by, and, and have a life that has no vitality. Mm. Murray? Yeah. Uh, Christina Hi. Shinsky, uh, she, uh, she's given some lectures, she wrote the book on replacement children, but she's given lectures also in what she calls TTT, transgenderal, transgenerational transmission of trauma mm -hmm. transgenerational transmission of trauma mm -hmm. and uh, she studied this phenomenon and in, uh, i think she comes from a, a german polish family or something yes uh, and it's also been taken up very much by people in the baltic countries i know in lithuania who um whose grandparents were sent to siberia by the russians um and um uh and they are um, in the third generation becoming conscious of how this previous trauma inflicted on their grandparents has affected their lives. Now, partly is through the unconscious, partly it's through stories that are told or the history that's recited. Uh, but this uh, suffering continues through the generations one way or another. Yeah. There's no question about that. And the big trauma like war, um, devastation, <laughs> uh, earthquakes, things like that, that affect a lot of people, um, pass like waves, gradually perhaps subsiding. But in the third generation, you have a chance to ask some questions, become more conscious, and maybe work it through. And we say, work it through. That means you face the suffering instead of covering it up and running away from it. You face it head on work on it, look at it, uh, digest it, and gradually <laughs> it gets taken care of so it isn't passed on again to the next generation. Uh, so that's what we do in therapy. You try to work through, you try to look at the suffering, whether it's yours, your parents, grandparents, um, and um, take it as a responsibility to try to um, suffer it through and uh, become conscious of it and uh, the more you do that, uh, the less it will affect your life in unconscious my, ways. My question was more like the archetypal pattern. In other words, the suffering in a third generation will be almost like an imprinting of the trauma. So, so Henry, you were speaking of the uh, replacement child. So that would look a certain way. The concentration camp suffering would look a certain way. So my question was more, whatever the trauma was, 
it's almost like reading a fairy tale. Could we read from the current suffering or what happened to the grandparents and vice versa? That was one of my questions, one question. And it made me think because I've seen people with COVID and I don't want to go into the medical side of it, but I've seen people with COVID sometime or long COVID almost resembling in it. So the long COVID, and obviously it's very specific and very individual to the person, but the long COVID suffering looked like the suffering of the grandparents in a concentration camp. Okay. That was my question. Oh, you asking your thoughts about that. That the suffering would be um, very specific um, yes. in its form, uh, yeah. physical and mental. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yes. But I will say one syndrome okay. that we find very, oh, sorry, go ahead, Marie. No, it'd be something to research. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Israel, we, we often speak of people of the second and third generation as memorial candles in the sense that they are suffering for the sins of others, but their life does not belong to them. Mm -hmm. and, and any kind of deviation from the collective or from enshrining the memory of what happened is seen as a kind of betrayal of so forth. So I've had patients, for instance, where say an adolescent is, is, or a young person is trying to individuate and like separating in a no, very completely normal way from the parents' values and say, you know, they want to do something a little eccentric. So the mother says to them, you can do it, but you're worse than Hitler. Look what you're doing to me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well, I have this uh, replacement child issue a bit because I had a classmate at the basic school in the Marines where um, he was killed in Vietnam five months after we graduated. We were both second lieutenants. And for my whole life, I've felt a responsibility to... to um, you know, live my life to the fullest so that I could live what Bob, his name was Bob Christian, um, ironically, um, didn't get to live. And every Memorial Day, I remind all of my daughters and grandchildren uh, about a certain sacrifice that he made for me didn't happen on the battlefield, but he made it and and I've written about it. And I don't know, is it better to not repeat that story and that trauma or better to present it and let them deal with it? Well, you know, in the Jewish tradition, the worst thing is if a person's name is forgotten. So I think you should remind the name and say it. And if it's traumatic for them, it may also be creative for them. Clearly it pushes you. What you did individually is very common in certain cultures where when a person dies, the other person literally uh, inherits the rest of that person's life and they have to as it were, live for two. Yeah. Even marry the, the brother's uh, wife. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay, well, I have uh, two questions that I promised for the end, and uh, we'll let, after my questions, we'll let Tim, Tim do a wrap up and check if anyone else has some burning issue. My two questions are, uh, what were the, what was the call that caused you to want to write the play, number one, and number two, what was your objective in writing it? This is for Mary and Henry, of course. I think you have to start, Mary. Okay. Uh, my first call uh, was curiosity. What did they say to each other when I found out that there had been a meeting and you couldn't read very much about it and there wasn't any information about it? And I walked past that hotel where they met in Zurich. I wondered, what did they talk about? They were in there for a couple of hours together. So it was curiosity. And the other thing was, um, I really did feel that um, we as Jungians have to come to terms with this shadow issue, not just Jung, 
but um, as a as a as a group, we need to face um, the shadow issue that that Jung raised um, during, uh, uh, as a result of some of his statements and attitudes, uh, because that isn't going to go away, and we can't sweep it under the carpet. So. I think the call for me was to bring it into the open and deal with it as uh, directly as we possibly could in this play. I did it because Murray called me to do it. <laughs> that was the call. <laughs> but you obviously saw it was important. Yes, I think for me, I mean, partly it was a wonderful to Murray to ask me to do something with him. I mean, Murray is one of the greatest Jungians today in so many different ways from South Korea and BTS all over the world. And, and also Murray, unlike many very successful people is like a super mensch, like a really decent stand up guy who's like in it for the work and not for himself. I don't mean, you know, we all have a certain amount of ego, why not? You know, and, so forth. and for me personally, I think I'd mentioned that, you know, I grew up in a family where theater was very essential. And I acted in high school and I wrote plays and I even wrote a play about Martin Buber that was uh, ironically performed just after Murray left the UAL Divinity School. That's right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> But to answer the second question about objectives, I don't think art has an objective. So I don't think the play has an objective. It was a wonderful journey and process. And being with you today is like beyond wildest expectations. Isn't that so, Murray? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Really, um, you know, in the background of, of my mind for this play or what stimulated uh, the concept in a way was this. Uh, play, you know, mm. that Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Yeah, yeah. By, uh, Michael Frayn. And he did the same thing with a, a conversation, uh, you know, that took place between Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg in Copenhagen in mm. um, the late 1930s, I think, or 1940, no, 1942 or so. And um, um, again, um, what did they say to each other? And there were, th there were three actors, two men and a woman in that play. And that's what we did with our ensemble. Oh. Um, and so that, that was a kind of model. Um, yeah. But these are very serious issues. On the other hand, the Heisenberg um, uh, Bohr uh, uh, discussion was about building a nuclear bomb, yeah. you know, designing, using science to destroy massively pop innocent populations. That was the issue there. Um, and the issue between uh, Jung and Beck, it's a very serious issue about responsibility for shadow, taking responsibility. We all make mistakes. We all say stupid things um, that we regret later. And we have to face it and take responsibility for it. And Tikkun Olam, which Henry taught me about Tikkun Olam, is to repair, uh, yeah. to repair the damage, to repair the world. We all make mistakes, but let's repair them afterwards. That's the, uh, that's yeah. the positive um, yeah. message of this play. Yes. Well, and you maybe, guys, in go addition, ahead. I, just take a minute, I would say the objective of the play was to be able to meet all of you today. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much, Skip, for pulling this together. It's a great gift. It's a yeah, pleasure. and thank you, thank you for for writing this an amazing piece of work. And the thing that it really leaves me with is this idea that every one of us is responsible for repairing the world in our little tiny place in it. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't matter where we are; uh, we all have that opportunity, and we all have the responsibility to to uh, to step up to the plate thereby. <laughs> So thank you so much for this. Yeah. I want to just take a to 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 share one thing. Um, Skip commissioned me to do a portrait of him every year, 
And this <laughs> summer I've been working on a portrait of him that, that uh, kind of wraps up this conversation. <laughs> it's called Jung Visits Skip. <laughs> uh, uh, Union uh, habit uh, skip. <laughs> and maybe, uh, uh, maybe you'll recognize that this is a the famous photograph of Jung with his hands clasped in front of him. Yeah. So that was <laughs> that was done in in the honor of Skip doing this role. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm very touched. <laughs> I want to speak up on behalf of Sherry because uh, she heard a big bang in her neighborhood and her electricity went out. That's why oh, she's not here. Oh. Uh, but she just wanted to pass on, you know, her her thanks and uh, blessings and uh, being grateful for having this opportunity. And, yes, and thanks for, you all for for joining us. It's been really a pleasure. Yeah, we and, very much look forward to looking you. at the next play to see. What yes, indeed. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Sophie. All right. Shalom. Shalom Peace. from Jerusalem. Shalom. Bye now. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for all everyone being here. And thank you, Mary and Henry. I really appreciate this hour you've spent with us. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you.